right. Who's excited to get back into Genesis? Woo! Come on. Woo! All right. Cool. Hey, before I get into Genesis, just uh, um, just want to introduce a, a friend of mine. It, it's neat how how God cro- you can meet somebody and then God will cross your paths 15 years later. Um, some of you, you know, Daniel Lemke, who's who's a part of our community, and he's been, his work and passion is to work with human trafficking, and he's a part, he's here in Turlock now, but his his younger brother, Josiah, um, I, I met Josiah in 2002, and he was a kindergartner with a freckled face, and just a goofy little guy. He was one of my very first campers, who I'll never forget, and, and uh, Josiah, just raise your hand. And it's just so cool. So he came in town with his brother just for a day, and uh, where God has brought him now, he's now he's about to graduate with his engineering degree, and he's praying about missions, actually, and looking maybe to go to Indonesia and see how God can use his talents to serve his kingdom on the mission field. So pretty cool. So say hi to Yosai. He's going to get on the road. Um, the rainstorm came just in time to drive back to Colorado. So um, pray for his safety and uh, enjoy your last moments with us. Good to see you, man. I like your beard. Beard's in style now. That's I don't know. Okay, at least I think it's in style. That's why I have one. Enough small talk. Genesis chapter 18 and 19. If you have a Bible, would you open up to Genesis chapter 18? If you don't have a Bible, I'll have the text on the screen. But I do encourage you, just in your walk with the Lord, um, I, it's great to have your own Bible so you can make your notes on it. And you, when God teaches you something that you want to remember, you can underline or highlight it. And let's say you're in, like, the generation behind me and you do everything on your iPhone and iPad. Um, you can make highlights on your iPad, and you can remember that forever, too. So I um, hope you have your own Bible, but we're in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. What I want to do for you, because it has been quite a handful of weeks since we've actually been in Genesis, I want to give you just a quick recap of the context of the book of Genesis, and then I'm going to catch you up to Genesis 18, but I won't tell the whole story. I'll just get you to the point that we're at. Now, if you remember where the book of Genesis came from, it was written by a guy named, does anyone remember? By Moses, right? And Moses had this incredibly special relationship with God. While Moses was leading the people of God through the desert, Moses would meet with the Lord face to face. He'd go in the tent, God would show up, and they would literally talk together. And it was during this time when I believe Moses wrote uh, the first five books of the Bible. Now, I also believe that as Moses was writing this particular story, um, it came at a very important time in history. I want you to remember a second um, the context of uh, the Israelites, right? They're in the desert, but recently they were in a place called Egypt. And how long were they there? 400 years. Those of you who are answering, I tell that you listen here at church. This is good. They were there for 400 years, right? Right? And while they were there, they were under slavery and oppression by the Egyptians. And, and the reason for that is God had brought them there. But as the Israelites grew in number, the Egyptians got scared of them. So they made them slaves and they worked them hard to control the Israelites. And the greater they grew in number, the harsher this slavery was. Can you imagine? 400 years. Some of them, some of them baked bricks in the sun. Some of them did the construction projects for Pharaoh. Some of them um, simply worked on the fields. But while they were doing this, when they didn't work hard enough, they would get beat. Many times they would be beaten to death. Sometimes when Pharaoh said there's too many babies being born, Pharaoh would put a message out to kill all the babies. And on a regular basis, these Egyptians would remind the Israelites, listen, you're just Israelites. We're Egyptians. We're a something. You're a nothing. Because if you were a something, your God would rescue you. But our gods are better than your gods. And they would be reminded this day after day, year after year. And imagine what it would do to you after 400 years. Well, eventually, in this oppression, right, God, God hears the cry of the people. And God rescues them from Egypt with a mighty hand. He takes them out to the desert. Now, the rescue from Egypt was incredible. It was miraculous. It was beyond anything we could even imagine. But even after the miraculous rescue of God, these people who came out of Egypt couldn't quite grasp a God who loved unconditionally. 
and a God who is powerful enough to take them through anything. And you can find that over and over that people can't trust God. And why? Well, because for 400 years, all they heard were lies upon lies upon lies. And now that they're in the desert, God is saying, listen, I'm going to speak truth to you now. I'm going to teach you about your history and about your roots so that you can know beyond a doubt who you really are and the purpose that I have for you. And that's what Genesis is, right? The book of beginnings, the book of the creation of the world, um, but also it's a family history. And right now in the family history, we, we're, at a, we're at a guy named Abraham. And Abraham is the father of the Israelites who are in the desert. And so as the story of Abraham is told, it's the story of the Israelites. And when they see what God does in Abraham's life, they can know this is the God that is our God. And so here we are in Genesis chapter 18. We find that Abraham, uh, when we talked about this before Christmas, Abraham was at a tent. He was, they had pitched their tents, and Abraham and Sarah were together. And three visitors had shown up, uh, two angels, and one was the Lord himself, shows up and he speaks to them. He says, listen, everything the Lord has promised to you, and the promise was that they'd, be, they'd have a great nation, have a lot of kids, but they were, remember they were old, they were past childbearing, and they had no kids at this point. But the Lord shows up to remind Abraham nothing's impossible for the Lord. And the Lord says, in a year, you're going to be with child. Now that's where we find ourselves. Um, but that's not the only thing that happened in this conversation. And so what I want to do is read to you the next part of the story. How does that sound? Good story. It's really challenging. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom. Okay, Sodom. Who's in Sodom right now? Who remembers? Lot. Abraham's nephew that Abraham really loved. But is Sodom a good place or a bad place? It's a bad place. Okay, good. And Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he had promised. Now, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody, or maybe with a group of people, and you're like, I know something, but I don't know if I should tell you. You know what I'm talking about? When a person says that, they fully intend on telling you what they're saying. They're not sure they're going to tell you, don't they? But what they're really saying is, I have important information that I want to share with you. And when you start it with, I don't know if I should tell you, you're saying, this is important. But because I'm going to tell you, I trust you with this information. You're the person who needs to hear this information. Now, in our scene that I just read, right, you have... You have the, the angel, the angel, you have the Lord, and you have Abraham. And the Lord's talking to the angels, and Abraham, they're all together. He says to the angels, hey, should I tell Abraham what we're going to do? And of course, he plans on it. Now, in this reason, the writer gives us the reason that the Lord wants Abraham to know. And do you see what it was? Abraham goes, or the Lord goes back to the promise. He said, Abraham... Abraham is the one I'm going to bless and make a powerful nation. It is their job to bless the nation. But because I'm going to do this to this other nation, I need to talk to, to Abraham about it. Now, granted, it's very interesting when you look at the Lord in this picture, right? And there's, there's, a, there's a tension and dynamic to know in Scripture the Lord, I believe, actually I know, the Lord knows exactly what's going to happen in Sodom. He knows how wicked Sodom is. But he steps back. I, I don't want to say that he, he be, doesn't become God. It's, he sets aside this piece of himself, which is a mystery, and he comes to Abraham as a man. It, almost like 
like God is in the decision-making process, but he wants Abraham to be a part of that decision-making process, which is very interesting, and we'll talk more about that. Let's jump in, let's get going, and see, see what the Lord says that he wants Abraham to be a part of. He says, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. God already knows this, though, doesn't he? But for his purpose with Abraham, he's like delaying the decision because he wants to talk to Abraham about it. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So, do you see how the Lord sets up the scene? Abraham, I have something to talk about that's a big deal. Are you ready to hear it? And, Abra and God says, Abraham, you're, you're the man that I want to talk to about this. He says, here's the problem. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Now, when you hear, when you hear the word outcry, it, what, what the Scripture is saying, it's not that, that God is hearing the, perhaps the, the inhabitants. Well, maybe he is. What he's hearing is those who have been oppressed and afflicted by the sins of Sodom. Those are the people who are crying out to God, right? They're saying, God, you need to do something about Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is affecting us and it's holding us down. So as God hears that, he says, I'm going to go check this out. Abraham, I'm going to go in a few minutes go see what is going on there. But once God introduces the topic... What do the two angels do? The two angels walk away, leaving only Abraham and God. Now, I think what's going on here is a little test for Abraham. Why? God has just told Abraham, your job is to be a blessing to the nations. And I'm about to judge this nation and destroy them. Abraham, what are you going to do about it? How is this going to work? Abraham rises to the challenge, and I want to read you the conversation. Then Abraham approached him, the Lord, and he said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it for you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? And God says, if I find 45 there, I will not destroy it. And then it goes on. And Abraham keeps haggling with the Lord about the number of righteous people. And Abraham gets him down to 10 people. It's a very interesting passage, isn't it? Um, when you read about this passage... And you read what the, the smart people say about the scholars and the commentators. They say this passage in this moment is absolutely remarkable. And sometimes, as Westerners and as Americans, we don't fully grasp what has just happened in the text. Let me, let me help us step out of American and Western culture for a second, okay? Um, in American culture... We are highly, highly individualistic, aren't we? Now, that individualism applies to all sorts of things in our lives. But one of the things that applies to is when we think about sin and guilt. And we tend to think about guilt and sin in individual, you know, in individual factors. Like, um, I am not, you know, I'm the one who sinned, therefore I am guilty. 
right? Individual thing. I have sinned, but that doesn't mean that my family's guilty. But here's the thing. In most parts of the world, and in the Old Testament Bible, there's a corporate understanding of sin and guilt. And so if someone in my family has sinned, we are all guilty together. Now, of course, this becomes kind of a very complicated thing to talk about. But what you have to understand, this is the mentality of Abraham, because that's his culture. Let me give you perhaps um, maybe a, a, more, a more relevant example. But as I try to use this example, um, I'm, just, I'm just saying I know this is a very complicated issue to talk about, but it'll help you understand the mindset. So obviously in our country, years ago, uh, we had this uh, horrific institution called slavery. Africans uh, were brought over to America. They were forced into harsh, harsh slavery. And by the grace and goodness of God, eventually that period came to an end. But what we have to understand is the effects of that period have gone on and on and on in ways a lot of us don't even understand. And so what happens is you'll have generations of African Americans who uh, African Americans who've lived in like systemic injustice. And we want to say, well, you guys just need to get it together and stop hurting each other. But what we don't understand is they've grown up in these communities that are so dark and so under-resourced, they don't know what else to do, right? Now, here's two ways of looking at that. Let me just, so here's how it plays out. One perspective is, is, an, is an American, indi, in an individual perspective, I'll say, well, hey, I grew up in the suburbs. And in my high school, I had African-American friends, and we all got along. All that stuff going on over there— you know, why do people keep blaming, not, like, white people for it? That's not my fault, right? I've done nothing to contribute to that. That's an individualistic response. Does that make sense? I'm not saying right or wrong here, because it's a very complicated issue. Now, a corporate mentality would say, well, yes, there's this systemic injustice going on here that came from the generation before, the generation before, the generation before, and the generation before, and, and my my forefathers were the ones who oppressed this people, and the train just kept going down. And so it's all interrelated. And so therefore, I share corporate guilt for what's going on here. It's two ways to look at this particular issue, and I'm not telling you either right or wrong, because it's complicated to talk about it. I don't want to make the news for saying something right now. Um, <laughs> just saying. However, though, right, in the day of Abraham, they would have said corporate responsibility. They, they would look at the systemic injustice and say, we're, we're a part of that group. Let me give you an example. How many of you have heard about, um, there's a character named Achan in the scripture. You've heard about him before? Um, so when, when a man named Joshua was going into the promised land, the Lord had led them in a particular conquest, and God's people had to conquer the nations as God had led them to do so. And by the way, evil nations— um, but, when, but God said, listen, when you conquer the nations, you're not doing it like the other nations. You're not doing it to plunder and get rich. And so when you conquer a nation, you're not to take their goods. You're to, you're to burn those goods so that you're not getting rich off of this. Um, but there's a guy named Achan. This is starting to ring a bell. Achan, Achan goes into the city, and he sees a beautiful robe and some fine china. And he thinks, man, it is such a waste to burn this stuff. I know God said don't take it, but man, this is beautiful. So Achan takes the robe. He hides it under his tent. But you know what happens after that? Is, Israelite, is Israel goes out to battle, all of a sudden they start losing. And the leaders go to God. They say, God, what in the world's going on? Why are we losing our battles? And, and God says, your whole nation, you're guilty. Because I told you not to take the plunder. But you've taken the plunder. So they go through a process, and eventually they discover that it's Achan who took the robe and the treasure. And what's so interesting about that whole story, right? His one sin, God held all of them guilty for. Isn't that interesting? And even when now, when Achan was punished, if you read that story, Achan dies along with his whole family. Corporate guilt. Corporate responsibility. Okay. So you see how kind of sin can be spread amongst us, that corporate responsibility. Now, I want you to see what Abraham's doing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Listen. 
He's asking God if instead of judgment for sin being shared as a people, what if, what if the righteousness of a group of people could be shared with the whole, right? What, what if, what if God instead, you could, you could judge all of Sodom based on the righteousness of 50 people. This idea is never found in Scripture up to this point. But the righteousness of one or a group being shared with the others. I'm sure that Abraham's waiting for a response from God. This is interesting. He doesn't know if God will go for it. But God thinks, I got you. Absolutely. If there are 50 righteous people, I will count that righteousness on behalf of all of Sodom. Abraham thinks, good, this is fantastic. But Abraham knows this. Listen, Lot went over there. Lot's family went over there. There's some righteous people in that family. But I don't know if there's going to be 50 people. So he says, God, would you be so gracious? Could the righteousness of 45 people, could that cover the community? And God says, yeah, I'll let the righteousness of 45 people cover the community. It goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, it goes on, until we get down to just 10 people. And God says, yes, for the righteousness of just 10 people, I will pass over the sins of that community. Now, I love Abraham's heart here. He doesn't just, I was thinking about this, I was trying to make sense of why does Abraham argue the way he does. You know, Abraham could have shown up when God, when God was there and God said, hey, I'm going to destroy Sodom. Abraham could have simply said, hey, could you just at least rescue Lot and, and my family? But he doesn't do that, does he? See, he does something really different. What I realize here is that Abraham understands something about what it means for his calling to be a blessing to the nations. And there's two things he understands. The first is this, is that God alone is the judge. I mean, we can make judgments, but the only person who can determine the destiny of salvation or suffering and judgment, that is God. So God doesn't show up when God, when God says, hey, I'm, I'm going to go check out the sin over there. Abraham doesn't step in and say, hey, you're right. It's pretty bad. You should probably take them out. But Abraham knows, wait a second, I'm not the judge. That's not my calling to be a blessing. But here's what he does know. To be a blessing to the nations, God is calling him to be the one who pleads for the nations. That when the nations are dark, when the world has gone astray, to be a blessing means to step into that gap and to say, God, please rescue this people. It's one of the first examples of prayer in the Old Testament, because prayer is asking God in a way, right? So he prays, God, would you rescue this people? And look how desperate he is. God, would you do it for 50 30, 20. God, would you rescue them for simply 10 righteous people? But he's doing more than praying. And you got to understand this about being a Christian. Abraham is doing something that I want to call priesting. Now, I don't know if priesting is a word, but from now on it is. But he's priesting, or he's doing a priestly thing, I could say. Because what does a priest do? A priest is someone who goes between people and goes between God. He represents God to the people, and he pleads to God on behalf of the people. Now, the fascinating thing about the Israelites, when they're wandering through the desert, remember, God has rescued them. God has spoken to them. And one of the things that God has told the Israelites was this. Look at this. This is the prompt, Exodus 19.6. You will be for me a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. Holy means set apart. They have a special purpose. 
But look what he says to the people. It's not just that you're going to have priests, because they had priests, a lot of societies had priests. He says, but you guys, your nation will be the go-between between God and all the people on this earth. You're going to be the ones who are pleading for even the most wicked for their salvation in hopes that something will happen and that they will turn so they will know and follow the Lord. This story is so that those people can look back to Father Abraham and know what it means to be a blessing. It means to be a priest for the world. Now the thing is, um, is we jump to the New Testament, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and we know that in the New Testament, so in the Old Testament, God is called the Israelites, but in the New Testament, God is called a new people, all who believe in Jesus, the Messiah who comes through Israel. Guess what? That purpose, that calling to be priesting does not change. Look at First Peter. Peter says to the church, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Church, we are priests, all of us, and God has put us in a position to fight on behalf of the people in our community and all the people across the world. Now, I'm going to take you back to the story for a moment. The story goes on, and I'm not going to read you the whole story, but in your time when you get home, you can read it. But they have the conversation, and they stop at 10. Now, granted, I don't know why Abraham stopped at 10. It's a little bit of a mystery to me, you know? I don't, I don't know if, if perhaps, perhaps when Abraham got down to 10 in the wager, he thought, surely, Lot's family... Between Lot and all the servants, they got ten. This will be good enough. Maybe he thought that. Or, or, or maybe, you know, Abraham just knew he was asking for a big thing. And he was pushing his luck. And it was time to stop. But Abraham stops at ten. And God says, I will stay for ten. But then as the story goes, remember the messengers who went off the two angels? The two angels keep going. And they arrive in Sodom and Gomorrah uh, to check things out. And when they get to Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, basically, remember as we talked about culture, a huge, val a huge value in that day of hospitality. When a stranger comes in, your job is to care for them. But when strangers would show up in Sodom and Gomorrah, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah would try to rape the visitors. And that's exactly what they try to do to the angels who show up. And when the angels are there and they do the survey of everything, they discover something. There's not ten righteous people. And so Sodom is going to be destroyed by fire. But you know, even though Sodom is destroyed, God still provided a way out for the righteous. Because the visitors, when they talk, they say, Lot, here's what's going to happen. God's going to destroy all of this. But if you trust us, if you run from this place and you don't look back, you will be saved. And maybe you know the story. When, when Lot told his family and his son-in-laws, he said, hey guys, listen, God's going to destroy this place. Trust me and follow me. Let's follow the angels out of here. Remember what the son-in-laws did? They laughed. They didn't believe in the promise of God. And so they stayed. The second part of it is when God says, go, God says, listen, trust me, don't look back. You remember, as they went, Lot's wife didn't trust God. She looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah. But God still chose to rescue those who had faith, even when he brought his judgment. I absolutely love what we just saw in the debate between God and Abraham. I was thinking about this even more. Why does Abraham stop at 10? Well, maybe in his heart of hearts, Abraham simply knew if he went down to one, 
the righteousness of one person would never be enough to cover for the wickedness of all people. And, I, and he would have been right. The righteousness of just the regular human being would not be enough to cover an infinite amount of sin and shame and guilt over a whole people. But in this text, we find a picture of the greater plan of God, right? Because this was the plan of God. When Jesus comes, right, Jesus is absolutely and perfectly righteous in every way. It's amazing. He walks with no sin. And he, he's like the infinite picture of righteousness. He is the only one who has enough righteousness to cover over the wickedness of all people. And what is the reward for a righteous person? Heaven, glory, salvation. And what is the reward for sinners? Guilt, shame, and condemnation, and God's judgment. Do you see what happens in the cross? Jesus goes to the cross. Instead of receiving the fruits of righteousness, he receives the fruit of our sin. And he suffers, and he takes on the full force of our sin and our shame once and for all on that cross. Therefore, we who are sinners, which is all of us before a holy God, we who are sinners now receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of the one is enough to cover all who choose to believe, who choose to trust God when God says, listen, there is judgment, but there's a way out. And the way out's not difficult. You simply need to trust me. Isn't that cool? I just think it's so beautiful. Um, Philippians chapter 3, he talks about it. It's a great verse. He's, uh, Paul is speaking to the church. He says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Look at this. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and the participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Can the church say amen? Love that, right? Amen, because the righteousness of Christ is fully attributed to you when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to end with this thought, because that's good news. I don't know all your stories, but I know a lot of your stories, and I know that many of you in this room have already put your faith in Jesus Christ. And therefore, you currently sit in the righteousness of God, which is probably something that we fail to realize how beautiful it is on a regular basis. But what I want to think about, though, is the purpose that God has given us as priests in this world. Because to be a priest in this world, it's actually a really hard task. You see, I can plead for, for my neighbors who live next to me and on my street and block and for my friends who don't know the Lord. I can get on my knees and plead for them. I can pray to God, God, would you, would you open their eyes so that they would know the Lord? If, if my children don't know the Lord, I can plead for my children. They're easy to plead for. But see, that's not just what being a priest is. A priest is pleading for the whole world. A priest is a person who pleads for their enemies. A priest is a nation and a people who get on their knees and they look at how ugly perhaps ISIS is and the hatred and the violence. But instead of saying, God, to hell with them, we say, God, would you soften their heart? Would you rescue them? Would you bring them salvation? And I'm telling you, that's a really, that's, that's a hard thing for a human being to muster up on their own. I don't believe it's possible. I think the only way you can be a priest is to look into Jesus and see that His righteousness covers your sin. And without His righteousness, you have nothing. But when you can learn to live in grace and gratitude and you can realize, oh my gosh, look what the Lord has done for me. It gives me the strength. It gives me what I need to become a priest in this world. 
Paul says we know Christ personally. A priest is intimate with God. Priests spend time in the presence of the Lord, and they plead for the world, and they plead for people. But a priest goes two ways, right? A priest goes to God, but then God sends a priest out to the people to show the people what God is like. So my friends, as we go this morning, that is my call to us. If you don't know Jesus, talk to me afterwards. I'll, I'll talk to you about faith and trust in the Lord. Um, but as we go, it's 2017. God needs some priests to stand up in this world, doesn't he? So let's do that. Let's pray. And God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the plan that you have put into human history that you've revealed to us about how you want to use people to bring salvation to this world. And God, if we look at any task or anything we can do, nothing is better and more glorious than being about your work. And so God, we pray this morning that you would make us priests, Lord. We pray that you would give us the courage and the strength to stand up in this world and to fight for every last person because, Lord, you want their salvation. Lord, make us want their salvation as much as you do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.